Um, welcome to a reading which we put together, uh, five readers who were published by Trainwreck Press, which is a nice independent press in Canada. And um, we're going to each read for about 10 minutes and then there'll be a little time at the end for discussion. So we'll begin with Anne Safola, who's the author of When the Pilotless Plane Arrives from Trainwreck Press. And she's also a translator of the hero slash hence this cradle. And I'll let her add anything she wants to the introduction. Welcome, uh, Anne. Thank you, Mary. Um, I just want to thank uh, John Goodman for starting this press and uh, curating such a distinctive variety of poets and translators. It's really an honor to be published by Trainwreck Press. I thought I'd read uh, from When the Pilot's Plane Arrives. Um, it's a bunch of poems inspired by um, cheesy sci-fi films from the 1940s and 50s. And in watching them, I felt a kinship between the storylines and my life as a poet. So um, a bit of a cautionary tale and um, hopefully some humor too. Um, okay, so the first, first poem I'm going to read is called First Workshopped Poem. And it's based on Bride of Frankenstein, Universal Pictures, 1935. 15 heads down, pencil your draft in what is needed. The bones of a 19 year old stolen from a crypt, a lab grown brain, new heart sacrificed by some young woman who never makes it home that night. No lightning storm, no electric woo woo to inspire your teacher to scream, she's alive. Instead, all open their mouths and look and like Elsa Lancaster arising from her palate, you look jerkily at each one, startled, born a minute ago, your hair vertical. One wants compression as in wife good. Another detail, dual neck knobs. More narrative, screams when monster moves to fondle her. Is that you hissing? Square heads, green hand, clutches cranked to blow tower lab to dust, yet instructs, go, live, let the dead die, I flee. Mary Shelley, what competition in horror. You wisely published Frankenstein anonymously. This next poem is called Emotion Must Be Authentic, and it's after King Kong Escapes from Universal Studios, 1968. Unlike automated replica that fails to mine element X on the North Pole for Madame Piranha and Doctor Who, the real Kong on the Isle of Mondo saves stalled sub crew from a rabid T-Rex. In particular, one nurse, Susan, who in Kong's clutch squirms, Kong, put me down. A kind of first date, he obliges as crew escapes when T-Rex bites his foot. Looking back, Susan protests, he's in trouble. And more so when Dr. Who kidnaps Kong to pole. But the simian swims to Japan where await Dr. Who, robot, and yes, Susan, breaking past civil guards, her heart-shaped lips, Kong, Kong, go back, a trap. You can see him recognize her. Links, tilts, hairy dome, as if to say, Susan, why Susan, it's you. But Robot grabs her, enraging Kong, who pursues it up a tower, catches her mid-air in black padded paw. As Madame Piranha unplugs Robot, who falls to scrap like Doctor Who's ship, Kong will crush. Oh, strange stirrings as matted hairy back swims away. Susan shouts, Kong, Kong, King Kong. Let him go, crewmates say. He's had enough of civilization as a giant ape, unhearing, unrequited, returns to his island home of Mondo from Tokyo Bay. 
This next poem is called How to Put Your Brain in Someone Else's Head. It's based on uh, The Monster and Girl, also known as Dead on Arrival from Paramount Pictures, 1941. Scott never dreamed his would go into an ape, but confronting con man who lured sister into whoredom by way of sham marriage, finds himself framed by mobsters whom he warns, you'll get yours one day. Awaiting electric chair, Scott agrees to bequeath his brain to mad scientist. Yes, he laughs hysterically, take it, take it. In his animal afterlife, makes good and crushes gangsters one by one. Sibling loyalty unrecognized as he falls, cop shot at sister's feet. Demonstrating links, the persona poem will go to lasso le mot juste, then bloodlessly crush every bone in its simian embrace. And the last poem is Propulsion, and it's after uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Columbia Pictures, 1977. The impossible sky, a pool you'd always tripped into. Obsidian night, narcotic. Five tones pierce fascia and bones. Image inside claws until you wheel in mud and straw. A mountain shade, deft saucers. Massive approaching dark, shattering bass note. And they all come home. Lost pilots, stolen toddler. Who is he? Whose eyes hold starlight his mother reclaims? What do you want? Home admits fluttering opal digits. What do you want? The universe, this harp, your child hand, fingers stretching to strum a nebula. Evening shadow of Venus making your adolescent shoulders itch. It's always been this way. A tuning fork for the world. I just want to know. You enter the sparkling city and know. You had already been taken long ago. Okay, and then moving along, I don't have the copy yet. We're excited to receive it of my new uh, translation chapbook from uh, Trainwreck. Thank you, John, for that. But I'm going to read from uh, Hence This Cradle, uh, this to uh, frame it. It's uh, 79 AD and Vesuvius has just erupted and a young woman who's missing her lover is uh, facing these moments. Words, oh, this is uh, a translation of, my, uh, El of Hélène Sanguinetti's work. So it's my honor to translate her. Words, barely sharp bits of glass, shining a little above the wall, that's all. To my wife, to my brother, to my favorite lover. My poor words, black teeth, they lay down crazily under bridges, their little feet shod with red cast iron. Before, someone in the house coughed a long time so that I could finally sleep without fear until morning. That was today. This is yesterday. Before being the recovered under the plumes, the swallowed, the emptied, the burst open under small rocks. Are you on your way? Don't come any closer. I'm going down to the sea, our child, the sea, you hear? A wave, a higher wave has never existed. And I come to your window, I am there. Open bird, open cypress, open life, young man I love. Plume, mute, cast iron. So often feared in my dreams are here, everywhere. The beggar's sandals, good for nothing. Neither pillows, shutters, cash boxes, nor locks which squeak so much that you believe them insurmountable at night, in order to meet again something which resembles us, awaits without us. Is this a hole in the window pane? It's you going away in your cart when you come back in one bound, you smile and disappear. Will I ever see you again, ever? Where are we going? Make bread, bread. All the world needs it so, but no words. Words are going to die and rightly deserve to. Put a ring in this bread for she 
who will come with her bee fingers nested in the sky. Unmasked, she will effortlessly, effortlessly slip on the ring and you will know that it's her, your own, and you will clasp her to you. You will say, Gazia, mine. Thank you very much for this opportunity to read. And now it's my pleasure to introduce um, Anthony Seidman, who comes to us from Los Angeles. He's the author of The Defining Crisis of Your Lifetime is Utopia from Trainwreck Press. And also his latest translation from Trainwreck is Yelida uh, by Dominican poet Toma Hernandez Franco, co-translated with Jim Cardenas. Anthony, welcome. Thank you, Anne. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to uh, thank John Goodman in, in, in virtual person for, for all the hard work and the wonderful curating that he has done. Uh, so I'll, I'll read first a poem from uh, this chapbook, The Defining Crisis of Your Lifetime is Utopia, and then I'll read from the translation of the Dominican poet. Um, so... <clears throat> From the defining crisis of your lifetime is utopia. I'm going to read the poem entitled The Mystery of Stolen Fruit. The man with slender pockets has a heart that crumples like newspaper. His boots crack ice even when his neighbors sleep on their porches and heat licks the avenue with tar smoking. Each of his eyes compressed into coal, while the wine in his veins hardens into rope, which he fashions into a noose. He no longer sees the streets for its trees and billboards promoting the vineyards of siesta. He witnesses a murder in some parallel tableau where a yellow glove nailed on Stalin's haunch is the sole evidence. His fingers search his pockets for the key that might open the door of smoke, fumbling for a thread to pull and undo the seams. Until then, a coolant the blue of crushed water inoculates night under his skin. Slow rain needles shut his eyes, and a loaf of bread grows stale at the hooves of the perennial goat. And I, I was thrilled when Goodman uh, agreed to publish this translation of Yelida. It is by a Dominican poet by the name of Tomas Hernandez Franco, who's widely celebrated um, in his country in the Dominican Republic as the uh, first poet to introduce free verse, uh, type, of, type of narrative poetry uh, that they had yet to be introduced to. And the poem is about a uh, Norwegian uh, man named Eric who is enticed by going to the Greater Antilles. And um, from there, it develops into a type of um, clash of voodoo gods and Norwegian uh, um, mythology um, from the result of the birth of his child. But I'll start with the beginning when we're speaking about Eric, when he was uh, so um, enticed by going to the Antilles. So this is from the poem Yelida, and Yelida is the name of the daughter that Eric has with a woman from Haiti. So this is, it's entitled in Spanish, Un Antes, which would be a before. Eric, the Norwegian lad, possessed a heart of fog, buried under a cold, narrow inlet of a soul. During his vagrant long rambling from horizon to horizon, he scarcely suspected that the boreal 
long winter bloodline that pounded in his temples was a wanderer's song. During the longest month of the year he was born, in the fishing hut of tar and nets drenched by waves, born between the sea's miracle and the midnight sun, to an absent shipwrecked father, now a swimmer among deep algae and sands startled by scales, gills, and fins. He was the fifth child born for the sea. Eric grew in its language of fishhook and current, force of the oar and simplicity of foam, just like all the boys at the beach, half triton, half angel. But Eric didn't know a thing about it. Pulse of wind and stubbornness of the prow. He could barrel through the names of fish from Henladen to Cape and through the prayers of the channel and of the bay. At the age of 15, he could rattle off a thousand gulfs and not counting the already remote and brackish breast of motherland, yet not a single thought of Norway had set foot between his blonde eyebrows. During the annual caulking of boats, flames, filler ropes, and tar, Eric was 20 years of age and a virgin inside his oilskin boots, and he believed children were born just like fishes during the still nights with the sea at rest. But his uncle, the helmsman and long in the tooth, recounted stories of islands with burnished and blue ports where hundreds of naked women carried coal aboard, where green birds abounded, boiling with obscene words, and where at night the brothel flowered with a deep voice from conga drums. The uncle mumbled a distant song, awash with sun and coconut trees in a tongue that couldn't be Norwegian and which set off small whirls in Eric's pulse of wind. 22 years of age, Eric possessed a black and blue gaze, a damned soul but a keel and rudder's will to reach the Isles of Sugar Mountains, where, as uncle said, Nights redolent with cedars smelled like rum barrels. Eric knew Norwegian sailors always jumped ship in the islands when they wound, but when they wound up blind drunk, the captain would kick them down into the ship's filthy hold, where they would return to Norway, thin and quiet and wan. With all of that, in a swift kick to his tail, Eric the Sailor was on his way. And after that, we have the process of Eric uh, falling in love. And then the fruit of this marriage is Yelida. And from there, we have a wonderful, wonderful uh, clash between uh, voodoo gods and the gods of Norway, of mythology, uh, battling over this child. Uh, so I highly suggest that you support Trainwreck Press and, and John Goodman's um, endeavor to produce interesting and promote interesting poetry because this is the first translation of Yelida to appear in English. And uh, Dominican poetry, despite the fact that we have many Dominicans living in the United States, uh, is not widely read. And this is something that is highly treasured uh, in their country. And uh, I thank you so much for allowing me to share my poetry and the poetry of Tomas Hernandez Franco. And it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Mary Newell. Mary Newell authored the chapbook Resurge Trainwreck Press, uh, published in 2021, and Tilt Hover Veer. She is the co-editor of Poetics for the More Than Human World, um, which is published by Dispatches, 
uh, for the Poetry Wars, if I remember. Um, very, very interesting uh, press. And she currently teaches creative writing at the University of Connecticut. And we are thrilled to hear her read her own work. Thank you, Anthony. And thanks to John Goodman and Trainwreck Press. So um, I'm going to start by reading a few poems from my first chat book. Uh, tilt, I'm sorry you're getting it backwards. It's Tilt, Hover, Veer. And um, there's a sort of dialogue here with science uh, or ecology, if you like. So I'll just give a few definitions. Diapause in the first poem is a sort of suspended state that uh, insects or butterflies will go into if the weather doesn't suit them for coming out. Butterflies can't fly below 50 degrees. So that's the context of this first poem. It sort of suits our time in the year. In the pith of diapause, tone held through the gap between crawl, chew, and flutter, sip, weather churn. On the brink, wings rolled ready, Colors soft through chrysalis wrap, slow unfurl, finding the updraft. And the next poem is called In the Pith of Attenuation. This book is organized around um, hinge theory, actually, of Heller Levinson, in the sense that it has a particle in the pith, and most of the poems relate to that. And I I'm very interested in pith because it's the sort of center feeding column of a plant, but it's hollow. So it's both hollow and nutritive. And it has that double sort of edge. And this poem refers to murmuration. And if you've never experienced a murmuration, I, I highly recommend that you arrange to do so. It's a self-organizing phenomenon where birds, for instance, swifts who eat insects will be flying around randomly and Sometime around twilight, they'll self-organize into a spiral vortex and go into the nearest cave or, if necessary, chimney. In the pith of attenuation, excruciate at the crossroads, chiasmic tangle, climacteric muddle, Janus pole, cross wires, warp wrap. Heed elusive, scale nuance, interval trill, attune, consonants throb, murmuration. And I'll read uh, one more poem from, from this book. Uh, this refers to a Japanese technique of fixing broken pottery called kintsugi or kintsugi, depending on what part of Japan you live in, um, where you take uh, lacquer mixed with powdered gold, silver, or platinum to repair the cracks. In the pith of breakdown, rose draws in petals at dusk, forgets to relinquish clutch at sunrise. The world, a rack, Stretched pervious or unbearable, shatter, break out, rally, a plea for kintsugi, cracks filled precious, meander, fusion, sheen, luster, reclaim, gold or platinum, neat or overflow, gratitude for the flow that seals the ruptures. And then I'm going to read from um, Research, which is a chapbook published by Trainwreck Press. Uh, this is a cover picture done by my friend Susan Obrant. This, this is a narrative chapbook, so it's really hard to select um, poems that stand out individually. So I'm only going to read a couple, but I hope you'll have a chance to read the whole of it. <clears throat> And uh, I will say that one of the characters is a gardener, so that gave me permission to write about hummingbirds and 
flowers, which um, I like to do. So this first poem is about hummingbirds and salvia. Now, salvia is a plant, for those who don't know, and hummingbirds and salvia are sort of famous for co-evolving a mutuality where they really suit each other uh, very well in terms of the tube length of the salvia and the hummingbird's um, beak. And so aside from that, hummingbirds have the honor of having created a whole new color of salvias, the ultraviolet tone, which unfortunately is an annual, but it's a gorgeous flower. So co-foster, and this was, uh, an earlier version was published in Blaze Fox by Jeffrey Gotza. Co-foster, hummingbird tangles with salvias. Generations of entwine fold into this smooth bonding. Locomotes by quiver, broadcasts by whirr, Ripple of flight wake, figure eight spin outs, flash, iridescent green. Needs frequent sweets to sustain geared up heart. Whiz zip, hover, to sip with forked tongue from deep throated blooms. Salvia's trapdoor stamens rub pollen on transfixed head of sipper who soon flits with gold corona to blend pollen from mauve and blue salvias, forging new ultraviolet tone. And one more hummingbird poem, Intervolve. O oh, voltaic garden flit, your volant frivols smile me. Hummingbird, your socum volutions Gyrating phosphorescence, fructuous volary, profligate pollen disperser, emit a hint how not to clutch so hard it shreds tendons, rips heart house. Joy in vol, in volatility, deep intake, lunge into spacious. And this is a poem also from Research, which was uh, before that published in Ethel, which is a lovely little chapbook, um, handmade chapbook. And it has a epigram from Angela Merkel, between words and deeds, there is a C. Adrift in undrinkable waters. As a toddler bewitched by starfish, a riptide almost carried me away. Safe arms surrounded tumbling hollers. Almost is a long way from drowning. Sand in the mouth, sea vomit, limbs flailing, then home to lap of comfort. Distant calamities trouble calm, attempted rescues, urgencies, salt, famish, heat stroke, top size, ocean swallows without a burp. Arms can't reach through a newscast to help those stripped from home, land who risk the turbulent vault. The ocean tantalizes, seduced by its rhythmic pulse. I forget undertow, dead zones, toxic cargo permutating cells. And then I have one um, so far unpublished poem that I want to end with. And uh, this goes back to an original garden you've probably all heard of, and it refers to the two sons of Abraham, in case you're not familiar with them. Ishmael was the son of Abraham and Hagar, and Isaac was the son of Abraham and Sarah, um, the former being an ancestor of Mohammed and the latter, the founder of the 12 tribes of Israel. The pollinators cross, say Eve left first, right away doesn't like remonstrance. 
Did she invite the serpent to hiss Gothonic wisdom? Or did he uncoil and slither along? We have no record of that moment of decision or avoidance. Adam hung back, sulking. Wasn't all of this meant to be his? She went on, planted a garden with a tree, an apple tree, or was it an apricot? Generous with the fruit, Eve kept only a third. Of the rest, she gave half to Ishmael's progeny and half to those of Isaac. They planted the pits. Trees grew and thrived, but not together. Sky god worshippers in warring assemblies, firm in dissonant truths from Abraham's split heritage, pilgrimage to the shared, partitioned golden locus, their prayers transected by grudges and grief. Scent of fruit trees in bloom wafts across borders. One day a honeybee from some struggling hive buzzed from one tree to another, cross-pollinated across barbed wire. And so a tree grows that doesn't remember bloodshed. Who will eat that fruit and what knowledge imbibe? Thank you very much. You introduce somebody? Introduce somebody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I will. No, I will. I am. I am. So next, our next reader will be Heller Levinson, who is the originator of Hinge Theory and has expressed the desire to have a short introduction. Um, so that's ready. good. Okay, it, it's a thrill to be here, uh, to be able to honor and celebrate John Goodman, who's bringing these fabulous poets forward and, and being so uh, gutsy in his single-handed heroic uh, endeavors. So thank you so much, John Goodman. And thank you, Mary and, and Anne, for bringing us all together and making this happen. Uh, so I'm going to start off with Lurk. Uh, John also published prior to Lurk, Seep. And the major in focus of Hinge over the last few years has been to uh, cultivate, explore, and, and magnify the word, what I refer to as the term, word, subject, term, I lump together. And th the uh, hope is that after you read, the, I'm going to read maybe three or four lurks, but after you read in the books, there are over 60, 70 lurks, and that you will begin to see the life force of language and that these terms will become like intimates. So when you come across as someone says lurk, you'll have a different vision. It'll be, it won't be this foreign, uh, uh, what would we call it? Uh, catatonic, lexiconic uh, corpse that you experience readily in today's world. So just like the rainforest and, and the polar bears and all the endangered, uh, situations we have, the language, uh, as I see it, is equally endangered. And one of my, uh, the main, my main job is to try and restore this, to re revivify. So, right, let's get right to it. Lurk. Lurk across dark. I'd like to be able to see the page. Lurk across dark, dudgeon pall, over haunt filled ground pit, range, gaunt, coiled, granule plier, stagger from storm, the upstart, the foul, wetted, phosphorus bone winding wards, gnaw, vociferous. Next one will be lurk, in the company of sinister, a braid, struck obod, gall, wither, whetstone, curved, no longer garrulous, chopped larcenies split the curb, planning for holidays, 
rumors seek flotation, the seats are all taken. In the company of remorse, stalled withers, desecrated pinion, lopped atavism, a place in the sun. And now we go to lurk gloom brooding. So you see like Mary did with uh, in the pith of submitting the word to a variety of, of modules casts the word and the term into differing dispositions. It sends you, it becomes a, a vast personality, I hope. Lurk gloom brooding, phosphor at lalo protraction smear, dank driven, mottle, drain drudge, lips shuttered obliquitous in primal conveyance, that strained utterance filtered for carelessness for racks of indiscretionary bleed. And I can't help myself right after Gloom, we're gonna go to this Lurk, this is the uh, most recent Black Widow Press publication. And we're gonna go uh, to a, a, a abyssal recant. So we're leaping from the Gloom, the Lurk Gloom to the abyss, which is probably, uh, convenient place for gloom to hang out in the abyss. So this is abyssal recant. Chant, chasm, sibyl slink, scribe, incinerate, char. From toothless counterfeit breath, scribble, scour, devour, compound, blot a neo-renaissance fetter strain. Compunction, but partition, ancient, Hallelujah, sideways. Lurk on administrative leave. So lurk on administrative leave sets up the idea of, you know, kick back, you know, you, you, you're going to hang out. So let's see where we go with this. Lurk on administrative leave, respire, meander, latchless, kick back, flaneur, lol, lollipop, succule, fiddle, languish, breath, irides, gestate, credule, crunch. Sphere cylindrical, moss murmur, abra cadabra. I'm going to do two more. So that's, uh, there's over, as I said, 60 lurks. This just gives it hopefully a little taste of, of the lurk, uh, the lurk organism, you know. Okay, will you please, okay. This is another module I've been working with called Will You Please? And I have probably about 20 of those that the Will You Please was the kickoff. Now we go into uh, various uh, excursions with that. <clears throat> will you please facts notwithstanding in a manner of speaking the balls in your court this too shall pass but before and just in case the matter gets out of hand there's always a stop gap a fail safe when the moment comes just pretend but play it safe check your battery be convincing these are good people this has never happened before alternate side of the street parking the privileged few it takes years not weeks news leaks fake 
faucets, turn off ramps sideways, not an easy decision to make. The majority form a majority. To make matters worse, worse, a light at the end of the tunnel. Libraries are closing. Cows smell like fish. If there's a remote chance, grab the opportunity. Hedonism arose. Thank you all for coming. It's an honor to be here. And we'll do one more. And that will be uh, called Astray. Uh, astray is a term, uh, one of the galaxies I've been living in. And I'm just going to, one of the uh, terms that interests me enormously. And the, the galaxy kind of is uh, constellated with. The you know seep lure lost linger meander errancy askew astray baffle bewilder uh, that's those are some of the elements in this galaxy astray a way way word depart de position quotidian dilapidation in the Flummox, Addo, Snafu, Shamazel, discombobulate kerfuffle of a bewildered geometry, askew, askant, carillon, honk, a call and evoke articles of faith numerically scrambled, culled for salubrity, sieved for maximum seepage, for perfervid truancies, preferential dodge, preternatural wander, foaming toward futurity, the vastly hilarious goblet dithyram. Thank you all very much. Uh, I'd like to now uh, introduce uh, Georgia Pabli Du, uh, the wonderful poet and artist from Los Angeles, California, and shortly on her way to Greece, I believe. Thank you. Um, John, thank you. Mary and Anne, thank you. To begin with, flesh. Before all else, my greetings to all poets, dead or alive. My dead, standing firmly behind me, perpetually sing my name. In ortu sanguinis per peregrinatum, casu ade elementa, surque perunt, gaudia ente. It's the living that can't stop haunting me. They seem deader than the dead. The dead feed me. Do you think this has grown as some sort of natural psychic mutation of the age? Perhaps it has something to do with being in the mountains or the wine of my own voice. I belong to Shiva. I looked inside my body for my soul. I only found the blue-throated one. There was no soul. A slave of extremes, I am both dead and alive. I have no need to extract the stone of madness. One can't be crazy enough. I am both Eurydice and Orpheus. I'm perpetually giving birth. My body is schrecklich. The, in fact, the body is schrecklich. All bodies are schrecklich. Think about this body, something curiously effervescent when good and evil reunite absorbs me. I'm a microbe dwelling on a microbe, orbiting a microbe. Language is the final frontier. Yet, like birds in need of a branch to land on, words need our flesh. Now from inside the Black Hornet's mine tunnel. Here the palm trees wave at you for Dean Moriarty. 
I live in La La Land. Here, palm trees wave at you, saying everything is possible. Enjoy walking around our gorgeous strip malls. Marvel at the Hollywood sign. Stumble at the Hall of Fame. Piss in an adorable latrine. Buy acid at Grand Central Market. Be sure to visit me one day while high on LSD. Together we'll hit historic Route 66 to Las Vegas. Like Hunter Thompson and Oscar Acosta, we'll look for the American dream in a taco. Or let 66 take us up to San Fran of another era. We'll kiss Carlo Marx, shoot with old bully, join Philip Lamantia performing peyote eating rituals, get drunk at the Vesuvio Cafe with Bob Kaufman, goof around with Dean Moriarty, goof around with Dean Moriarty. I live in La La Land, here palm trees wave at you, saying in reality, not much is possible. Still, be sure to visit me one day, we'll hit Another one from Trainwreck Chapbook. Helios, you adorable psychopath. Helios, you adorable psychopath. Your climatic shenanigans endear me. Go on, burn us all. Turn us into desert. Turn us into waste. But don't burn yourself just yet. Instead, let me dance with you, you gorgeously round serial killer. I slap you in the face, nibble on your lips, and ask you, what did you have for breakfast today, honey? Solis, you marvelous Mussolini. I want to gently masturbate your tentacles of fire and walls through your lava. Penetrate your soft chromosphere. Perform fellatio. Perhaps then you'll stop melting down the North Pole, farting out heat waves, setting our oceans on fire, burn down our forests. Surya, you sexy rapist. In a few billion years, you'll forget how to dance. You'll trip, fall on your face, run off on crutches like a crippled Jupiter from a ramshackle spaceship. Post-human vigilantes will watch you commit harikiri like a sea urchin. Goodbye now, Tonal Tinti, you wondrous life-giving murderer. Your 10 billion years are almost over. Cyborgs are breakdancing out of joy in the direction of their next star. Soon, you'll be a black hole. Gods and goddesses will hibernate in your groin. And we, the people... Forget about us. We're long gone. Who cares? It's over. So long, you beautiful round bastard. It wasn't that great. It wasn't that bad either. Last one from Trainwreck Chapbook. Two questions. Sweetest lesbia, dearest enemy. Listen to my cubist painting of sound. The first three colors compose five skinned olive trees pointing at the sun. The second two paint prehistoric women swinging to an infernal opera of this phonic size. Sweetest lesbia, don't stop listening. Half naked angels have appeared in your ears. Archangels with short hair singing Orphic hymns, removing their leather miniskirts, undressing their celestial sex, making serpentine movements undulated, undulating to an underground opera of inverted pigments. Instead, ask the moon to make love to you, as if you were an ancient oak of at least thousand years, and to play with your genitals, as if they were comets, Comets like erected octopuses landing on wide breath with drops of blue semen spilt on red earth. Third, there is the old sage perpetual humming. 
From his yellow eyes, Dravidian syllables of blue bread come crawling. The old sage arms dock in sand as you listened to my cubist painting of sound looking for the scorpions of lust. He only found a filled fossil containing two questions. I was glad he encountered only two questions because I paced around these two questions in tiny circles as fast as I could thinking, suppose these two questions would be answered by two other questions. And suppose I can't determine which answer goes with which question and which question comes after which answer or question and which question follows it. I'd be compelled to ask the ancient oak to once more make love to me while three-eyed angels watch as if I were an ancient oak playing with your genitals while your comets would look like my genitals, comets like resurrected octopuses landing on white earth with drops of red semen spilt on your blue breath. To end with, cosmic cyclopes. What would happen if an angel appeared among us, sold as a slave, shred to pieces, dissected, extracted to be used as an aphrodisiac, crucified, no interdimensional being would ever dare come into our world, I think. Extraterrestrial beings probably wouldn't even consider traveling to the blue planet. They're not crazy. They're not suicidal. Unless, of course, they're giants. And why wouldn't they be giants? Our star is a dwarf. Our planet is tiny. Intergalactic cyclopes are brewing plants, perhaps. But what could they possibly gain from coming over? Surely they wouldn't travel light years to have us as a snack. Perhaps en route to somewhere else? They might land on Earth as a step over like picking up a breakfast burrito while driving to the office. In, imagine them as tall as mountains, our ant-like brain versus their ramped up artificial intelligence, our insect-like conduct versus their interdimensional travels. We'd make a rather exotic meal, I think. They may open a restaurant serving living human beings, like how in China monkey brains were eaten once freshly cracked from the skull. Or perhaps they'd scoop a whole city, assuming it's a sort of beehive. They'll study us, trying to figure out what our vocalizations mean, trying to figure out why war is so inherent to our species. They'll produce seven-dimensional documentaries. Other beings will stream reality shows featuring our executions, hate crimes, chemical warfare, the Holocaust. Perhaps it'll be as amusing to them as how some of us feel watching male elks butting heads or soldier ants attacking a foreign insect, like young boys blowing up frogs or torture pets, or like when women were accused of witchcraft and burned alive at the stake. That was particularly clever and funny. They might set us up against another planet simply for their entertainment. My bet is that aliens are gigantic. And if they're interested in our resources, they'd probably swallow up the whole planet en route to more interesting places. We'll end up as eat these excrements. Together with our oceans, mountains, forests, animals, one huge turd. Gigantic to us, minuscule to them, of course. We'll be fertilizer floating around in space till some other species find and collects us uses us as manure to enrich their intergalactic fields, produce crops as large as Jupiter. Perhaps this is how humanity will be recorded. At another planet's history books, commemorating the destruction of our planet in the Universal Museum of Tolerance, extraterrestrial kids will learn about us in excursions to their cosmic museum of natural history. The blue planet became the brown planet like how gorgeous animals end up cooked, eaten, and excreted. Would that be so bad?
Thank you. So you're all invited to unmute now and um, we can have a, a short exchange. Those who would like. <laughs> Love that. Anne, is Anne there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, I, I'm just curious. I, I, I love the, where, where, where would King Kong be today? <laughs> uh, King Kong? Yeah. When did that He's come the... out? Uh, what date, really? I forgot, I didn't understand the date. Hold on a second, I'll tell you. No, I mean the movie, the actual movie. Yeah, no, I... I uh, uh, hold on a second. All right. I don't have that here, but the King Kong Escapes movie was 68. And the other one was pro the original was probably uh, 1930 something, if I recall. And I said that as a joke. I mean, I didn't mean <laughs> it as a joke. It wasn't meant as a joke. It was, it was really like when you think about it, so like the 30s. And King Kong represented, you know, going back to, to, to George's uh, wonderful poem, The Cosmic, uh, is there any idea of a, that kind of primal presence today, you, you know, uh, buttressing civilization is almost difficult to imagine. Today, the, the we'd probably see King Kong as some gigantic robot, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's more, more Frankensteinian. Uh, so it's really interesting when you would like what would that flesh uh how, how would that, that shape in today's world i mean so much has changed in 50 years it's remarkable i mean mm. uh so that's that's why i brought the question up I was... <laughs> well i think he'd still he'd be um hiding out on mondo his island where he'd be safe so that uh hollywood couldn't get him and <laughs> and uh, lock them up and charge admission like the original uh, movie. <laughs> um, Heller, I had a question for you. Okay. Um, I did come across the uh, Beckett quote, and I, I was wondering if that quote uh, inspired your whole, all your books. W which quote? It's a quote, he uses the words, he said the higher, I don't have it in front of me, but something about the higher ground for a writer um, is to seek and lurk. And I, I saw this quote and I was like, well, it, it, this must be the inspiration for Howler's work. Oh, oh I, I didn't write, I didn't quote it, did I? Because I, I don't know. No, no, I'm just asking you if, if that quote from Beckett no, inspired no, like, your love, journey. No, I'd love to see it. Okay. I'll find it for you because I, I, I thought it was extraordinary. I was like, oh, well, here's Heller right here. No, the, the, uh, the work's been going on for some time. Um, it goes, I mean, this book, uh, Tenebrae, is another term, but in this case, we have uh, 114 pages where, where the word is being used as a verb. So. Uh -huh. So getting so you're getting a different kind of disposition, but the word the word is flavored uh, more actively as in, in term, other than taking something like a lurk or a seep. It's more in that sense more plastic than I have it here because this in, this is this this you could read. Um, I hope I don't want to be taking up too much time. In other words, you could almost read this as as a uh, as a poem, tenebrae to the far far wall of a fading. Ar aristocracy, tenebrae to an axle disposition, tenebrae to a wheezing palliative, you know. So, no, I was pre, I, I didn't know about the Beckett. Okay, well, I'll get that to you. Please, please. Yeah. Very interested. Because I, I found it interesting. I felt like you're in a way, the spirit of what you're doing is also what um, Alain Sanguinetti, the French poet I translate, is doing is, uh, trying to make language edgy so that people pay attention to it as opposed to the, you know, subject, you know, verb, noun, uh, where we've stopped hearing and feeling language. 
well, that's very much what I, what I, I that I'm, that's what I call the lexiconic uh, uh, static. You know, mm-hmm. when, when you take a, a word like pathos, which mm-hmm. is in the dictionary is maybe this uh, paragraph, maybe mm-hmm. uh, lines, and uh, Mary Newell, myself, Will Alexander, and Linda Lynch, uh, we, when I was melancholy, I'm sorry, uh, we, we ended up writing a 90 page beginning to explore path, m- melancholia. Pathos is another book. Mm-hmm. So, yes, animating the word and, and yes. the full flesh and musculature. Right, absolutely. I, I had a question for Anthony. Yeah. Uh, uh, Anthony, uh, is it, why did um, uh, Hernandez Franco choose a Norwegian? I mean, I, I was trying to figure it out. I was thinking maybe it's a way to put his island home on full display through the eyes of somebody who comes from the polar opposite region. And I think it's exactly because that it's a juxtaposition of the, <clears throat> the way that uh, Hernandez Franco was imagining um, Norway. And then what's very interesting and actually quite peculiar is that uh, Hernandez Franco was a diplomat who supported uh, the dictator Trujillo. Trujillo was um, the Dominican dictator who really committed a massacre against Haitians. Oh, yes. But the poem Yelida celebrates Haiti. So it, huh. everything takes place in Haiti, not on the Dominican side of the island of Hispanola. Huh. So it, it's a very odd, peculiar poem. Yeah. And, but it's a poem that every Dominican poet, they know. It's kind huh. of like um, their, I don't know what, how to say, like. Um, it's like their touchstone. It's like, it's like their touchstone. Like, it's like every American poet knows Sunday Morning by Wallace Stevens or something right. like that. It's one of these poems that it's very much canonical. And it's, a, it's an extremely weird poem. Uh, and it gets weirder and weirder where the voodoo gods begin to clash with the Norwegian deities. And it's only about wow. 10 poems. And this is the first free verse poem ever published in the Dominican Republic. So... Wow. <laughs> so a lot of a lot of shock waves way back L- then. Lots of shock waves way 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 back then. <laughs> and I also have to admit that, in addition to um, Hernandez Franco being Dominican, he was also not a Afro Dominican. He was completely mm. a, a white Dominican. So there's mm. a, it's a it's a poem that has a lot of peculiarities, difficulties right. to it. But as I said, it's still celebrated nowadays in the Dominican Republic. Incredible. Really, what a wonderful service you've provided us. Well, thank you. <laughs> really, it's, it's amazing. Um, I have a question for Mary. Uh, Mary, uh, your, your uh, passion is the uh, echo poetry. And I'm wondering uh, which, is, which is stronger in you, the, the sense of, of wanting to uh, generate uh, justice and awareness, or is it the infinite metaphorical possibilities in, in nature? <laughs> that sounds like a year's discussion topic. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll answer it indirectly. At the moment, I'm pre- preparing a presentation on plant intelligence for the Northeast uh, branch of the Modern Language Association, which I volunteered for, although I don't normally do academic conferences because it's in Baltimore where my son lives. And I'm having a wonderful time researching plant intelligence um, through the biological side, but also through the, the side of thinkers who really think larger, think dynamic systems theory, think about Gaia, and sort of bringing those two together. The thing about straight science and and botany and biology is that plants are very weird. They're queer, they're they're extraordinary. The the amount of of differentiation and mutualism between plants and pollinators is just, it's just, it's it's, it's extraordinary in itself, you know, so just to honor that. Mm -hmm. But in the larger question uh, for me, I think to get through 
to get through the visible world, it, it's, you know, rather than going outside or beyond it, to get through it, to get through that fascination and magnificence. And then all the levels of, you know, mm-hmm. are there somewhere mm-hmm. enfolded, you know, mm-hmm. from, but from the details themselves are fascinating and the larger picture of interaction, which you can never really honor, you know, and mm-hmm. so that's a long answer to your question, but I think it's, it's really important for all of us to think of the place of a human um, to keep rethinking our place in the whole picture. You know, it's it because it's like with, with gender, you know, people say, well, men were on top and now women should be on top, but that's still a dichotomy. You know, you haven't mm-hmm. really improved anything really. And it's the same now people say, well, we're the problem, but you know, it's not going far enough and looking at, at what's mm-hmm. really going on, you know, and how we could, how we could be useful here <laughs> without making more of a mess. <laughs> anyway. Well, Mary Kelly, with a question. Do you know the recent book by Merrill Shel- uh, Merlin Sheldrake? Can you in- talk a tiny bit bigger, uh, louder? Louder. Entangled Sheldrake. Sheldrake. Do you mm-hmm. know Merlin Sheldrake, the Entangled Life book? Up to a point. I happen to have it right here. It, it, it adds to what you're saying, the, the um, mycelial frame. In other words, fungus, fungi centered as, and not just plant centered and human centered. We tend to make the discussion between plant and human, but the mycelium is, is a much bigger and primary network. So the interaction of those three, I'm wondering if that has entered your, your thought about this. Not me personally, but I know many people who do, you know, Forrest Gander, for instance, people who are very much into, mm-hmm. into that, you know, that level of interconnectedness. I mean, certainly I appreciate it. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, ex- extraordinarily um, different from the merely plant-centered view of things. It, the, the, the level of interaction is so incredibly um, broad and complex, actually. Yeah. Mary, it might be, Mary, it, it, it might be interesting to, to tell what you uh, related to me earlier about the bee and, and, the, and the flower cup. Well, I mean, I don't want to take over the whole discussion. No, it's, just, it's just a quick thing. It yeah. goes with what George was saying at the interplay. Um, yeah, I mean, for, for example, um, as, aside from the morph- morphological fittings of pollinators and flowers, there are these acoustic activities going on that the cup-shaped flowers, which are a lot of the flowers you know, um, actually pick up sound waves you know, and give them back. And so they've now discovered that um, a flower can tell when a bee is in the proximity. And they've actually tested it acoustically. It's not just any old sound, it's a particularly the bee sound, which apparently is a, is a deep, somewhere deep there. And it will, uh, this particular plant will, will sweeten up its nectar. It will actually <laughs> change the composition of its nectar. Now, if we could have that kind of sensitivity, you know, to each mm-hmm. other, right? Mm. You know, when someone walks in the door, what, what does this person need? You know, do they need something mm-hmm. sweet or do they need a, mm-hmm. you know, that kind Mary, of Mary, I thought we did have that connection. <laughs> <laughs> It's, um, anyway. I don't want to hog the conversation, so. I I was going to ask uh, uh, Georgia about her work. Uh, Again, like I I was thinking of, uh, you know, uh, the metamorphosis uh, (laughs) with the work because there was, uh, you know, an outrageous quality and it made me think of, the gods and the outrageous things they did and in, um, in Greek myth. And um, I was just wondering if that was a conscious part of your writing or not. Uh, the Greek myths part or? The, the Greek myths, yeah. And just the, the kind of the character well, of- I, Yeah, the character of? The character of the gods, you know, that they just, you know, they're, they do what they want. Uh, you mean like in the last uh, poem, for instance, in Cosmic Cyclops? Yes. Uh, um, 
you know, myth, of course, fascinates me, although uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily crazy about Greek myth, but, um, but this, uh, what, what occupies me is, um, uh, I, I don't know if that sounds abstract for a lot of people, but, you know, we, we, I, I'm, I'm dwelling on this microscopic little ball and it orbits a gigantic ball of fire for us. But in the context of the galaxy, it's again, also just a micro or, you know, and so all these events are happening here. You know, we fall in love and, or we get upset because we have a bad hair day or, you know, or Putin decides to uh, invade a country or, you know, all the crazy absurd things that happen on this microscopic little ball and um and you know there are planets and 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 stars that are much larger so i often think i uh, often think so maybe there's life out there that is just huge like you know maybe extraterrestrial beings are like you know giants and uh so what would they think about us you know Mm -hmm. if they knew you know how would they perceive you know our so that's what um you know, and I, I wrote that poem uh, perhaps also to uh, vent my, um, my shock and sadness uh, when I woke up. When was it? February 22nd. I don't remember exactly. And uh, um, there was war in, mm-hmm. in Eastern Europe. And, you know, mm-hmm. I, 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 I was born and brought up in Europe. So mm. it's very close to my uh, uh, heart. And, you know, to, it's like the unthinkable is happening and okay, it happens. It happens in, in, you know, at the very edge of Europe, you could say, not the civilized Western part, but, you know, it's still in Europe and it's very shocking. And, you know, when I was younger, I, I somehow believed that maybe in my lifetime, everybody, humanity would realize that war is crazy, cruelty, you know, everything is, Mm -hmm. but we who somehow mature into and evolve, but, you know, with, 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 with time, I, I've I've come to believe that it's uh, uh, inherent to us, Mm -hmm. that, you know, we are just inherently cruel, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, and, and, uh, you know, like the, like the 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 grand jeu poets like René Dumal and Roger Gilbert Lacombe, they said, you know, what can you do? You can only laugh with it. You know, laughter is the only thing that can sustain you in this absurd universe, and not like this absurd world, but the absurd universe. The the, the you know the fact that I am this this insect. <laughs> I'm like an insect. <laughs> you have to look at our cities and look like uh, uh, observe an anthill. You know, mm-hmm. try. You know, it's 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 just. Uh, sorry, I'm. Uh, I don't know why I'm getting so animated. Maybe it's because. Uh, uh, well, that's the only way I can cope with uh, mm-hmm. uh, perpetual confrontation uh, uh, with the cruel. Mm-hmm. Sorry, maybe I. You got more. Than no, that. no, I, I was just thinking <laughs> of a. A filmmaker I named, know named Frank Vitale, and he sees uh, he's done a whole um, film series on cities being actual organisms. So uh, I was visualizing that when we were, you know, positing this kind of perspective, the anthill perspective. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Question. It's great. So, Mary, I turn it over to you. Well, that's, we have about 10 more minutes if, if, if anyone wants to exchange and then we'll, we'll go on to our evenings. So feel free to speak up at this point and unmute yourselves if you want to. So if anyone wants to speak, maybe just raise your hand or something, or if not, then we'll just thank John Goodman again. It's a silent crowd. Okay, Sarah, go ahead. Before I go, I just wanted to say something to Georgia. I loved how you went from the micro palm tree waving 
up into the sky. Your work is just humorous. I kind of lost myself in it. Um, mm. You go from sexy desire and love into the whole thing of standing outside and looking at the world as someone in a spaceship might look at it. And I love that you, you're you very earthbound and yet you're not. Your work took flight at times and carried me with it. So I really enjoyed what you had to say. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Okay, well, many thanks to our readers and also to John Goodman. And I hope you'll buy our chat books. <laughs> help the press, help the writing. Um, contingent and enjoy more poetry and write, write yourself if you're so inclined. So thanks again for coming and um, onwards. <laughs>